Hey everybody, Sleep here, and I've been gone for a while, but I pose a question to you. Are you truly mad because of the exposed extreme 10 year long case of tax fraud, identity theft, kidnapping, and murder, or did you just miss me? Metroid Prime is a game for that one console box the Russians hate more than the gays. And this is what, what I like to call the Nintendo Shit Cube. And the reason I call it the Nintendo Shit Cube because it's a piece of fucking shit! This game originally fit onto a disc that would swear up and down to the heavens that it was just average in size. Take a look at the fucking game! This is a Nintendo GameCube game! This looks like a fucking chocolate chip cookie! Micro penis jokes aside, we will be playing this game the normal people way and running this very personally ripped and very legal version on the Primehack modded dolphin emulator. You are Samus Aran, local white woman turned bionicle space bounty hunter on the path to space jellyfish genocide. Along the way, explore high tech facilities and destroy the wildlife in an attempt to collect upgrades and brutally murder the space pterodactyl who killed your mother and father as a child. The lore goes deep. Since this is a first person shooter, you may ask, sleep, how's the combat? Shit. Utter shit. The combat more is a means to an end in this game, and will allow the player to take in the environment thanks to what will be someone with OCD's worst nightmare, the scanner. Nearly everything in this game can be scanned to find entire fictional Wikipedia articles on the wildlife and dead natives who once inhabited this land before being utterly eviscerated by cancer space math. Luckily for you, you are one of the most high tolerance crackheads in the galaxy, and so all the meth does is increase your melanin. The scanner is also a significantly more useful version of an early 2000s game fact guide, allowing us to figure out boss fights relatively easily, letting us gain further access to the various upgrades scattered across the planet. In a way, this game is somewhat like a base Banjo-Kazooie, with each upgrade giving you further tools to explore parts of areas you couldn't reach before. This simple gameplay loop has elevated a game nearly as old as me into becoming what I find to be the best video game of all time. One of my favorite moments in gaming history actually comes from this game. Following one of the most obnoxious and prevalent areas called Magmore Caverns, you have this moment of genuine bliss that hits like nothing else, that being Fendrana Drift's introduction. Walking into this digital orgasm of an area is something that has stuck with my mind since I was eight. The beautiful music, the visually thriving overview, the atmosphere is lush. This is one of the most melancholic areas in a video game period, and truly captures a time long gone in gaming aesthetics. <laughs> but with me selling this game so hard, there has to be a catch, right? Well, of course. This is a game from 2002 after all. Metroid Prime is a jank ass game that had the marvelous idea of not only making a first person shooter game have tank controls, but also having its player using this ancient relic of a controller from a bygone Mayan civilization. This means that the developers wanted you to stay still and rotate anytime you'd like to go somewhere that isn't straight and backwards. The game attempts to alleviate a lot of the jank from this control scheme by introducing a lock-on strafe system where by pressing L, the camera will attempt to lock onto whatever you're trying to shoot at. This will then allow you to walk in every direction while always facing your target. In addition, the game will give you access to a dodge and strafe jump by pressing the jump button. This sounds simple enough, and it generally is but sometimes does not take for account the amount of shit you can randomly lock onto in the environment which will often get in the way of combat. I nearly forgot to mention the strange attempt at free aim in this game where by holding down the R button you could stay completely still and do the sort of free aim. I actually think this is a solid tool for an exploration game, but in combat most newer players will not get much value out of it. Pressing the different d-pad directions is also crucial to your journey as this allows you to switch visors, changing the Instagram filters within Samus' helmet and seeing objects and platforms in the world that she couldn't see before. This also applies to your gun, as you have four different modes that you'll be able to collect throughout your journey that allow you to harness the elements. 
By flicking the C stick, he could change your beams around and use said elements in different contexts. Take for example the wave beam that gives a sort of electrical power to certain objects. But this isn't even the full extent of your arsenal, as Samus has taken some notes from the late Ted Kaczynski. By pressing the X button, you could go into her iconic morph ball form, changing your camera to third person. This allows you to crawl through small holes and engage in bombing the local wildlife. But do not fear, environmentalists, as Samus is a very forward-thinking person. One of the final areas of this game has you exploring a mine where the local space pirates are doing harmful experiments on nearby creatures along with the intergalactic version of illegal fracking. Thankfully, around this area Samus gains access to the portable thermonuclear bombs and allows you to Hiroshima your way through the enemy. Along the way, you may also find the final optional upgrade that upgrades your charge beam with the Y button. Samus, by hitting the Y button, is able to use a limited supply of many B-83 nuclear missiles which will home onto whatever enemy you're locked onto. One of the requirements for 100%ing this game is actually tied to finding every single one of these expansion upgrades for this weapon, giving you access to spamming this weapon. Well sleep you may ask, why do you need this many missiles? Well. I have plans that I cannot share right now or else the haters will sabotage me. As mentioned earlier, by using the missile button while having a charge beam attack ready, you are able to use a special move that will consume your stock missiles. Stuff like the wave buster becomes extremely broken late game on some of the final bosses and can make it an entire phase obsolete. Now all that information regarding controls from earlier, throw that shit away because we aren't in the early 2000s. We have the technology. By playing the Prime Hack version like I mentioned at the beginning, you are able to access a version of the game with mouse and keyboard controls. This makes the video game infinitely more tolerable for players. Once again, if you want to play this version of the game, simply go to the officially owned and publicly available Nintendo websites, hit the download now button, click the Metroid Prime Revision 2 ISO link, and drag the downloaded ISO into your Prime Hack edition of the Dolphin Emulator. From there, you can customize your controls to whatever you please. This game is full of soul. Amazing details fill many aspects of this game, with environmental steam fogging up your visors and leaving little drops of water for a couple of seconds, to the rainy surface of Talon 4 drenching your visor and gun with drops of water falling off your suit. Or take for example, the reflection of Samus looking into the visor that you can sometimes see after certain blasts. The final act of this game is one of the most badass in gaming, but often people get too skill checked by the backtracking required for the Chozo artifact hunt right before the final area. If you know what you are doing, you'll come to the Chozo temple near the beginning of the game and scan these statues, allowing for you to naturally discover the locations of these artifacts throughout your journey with these vague hints. If these are a little too much for you to find out, I would recommend finding one of the many guides for this game out there and finding the locations through there. Trust me, it's worth it. Returning these artifacts will allow you to progress to the final area of the game, but not before getting into a scuffle with Ridley, that one dude people were swinging over from Super Smash Bros. This fight is a battle of patience, with him shooting you with lasers out of his mouth, attacking you with his claws, mouth, and randomly airstriking you like you're in Afghanistan hospital in the 2000s. Defeating him will have God himself smite the space dinosaur from existence and you can finally make it down to the final area and boss. The finale of this game will require you to use every one of your tools and take advantage of every lesson you learned thus far. Just pray to God you aren't colorblind when fighting the final boss. Metroid Prime is about love, friendship, capitalism, the 1900s Great Depression, and the motivation to finally go forward in life. When Sam's finally avenges her family and eliminates a giant meth cancer jellyfish, she takes a moment to reflect on the great act she did for the world, and finally finds enough peace in herself to forgive the past and future killers of her family. Thank you so much for tuning into this highly retrospective and extremely accurate recounting of the Metroid Prime experience. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscription, and let me know how you feel about the game in the comments. Also, if you could, please leave a donation on my Patreon, where in the future I will hopefully give exclusive rewards to members who help fund the show. Also, if you'd like, come hop on the official Sleep Discord by using the link down below if you'd like to talk with me and the many members of a thriving autistic hellhole. So tune in next time for my 4 hour retrospective on the Industrial Revolution, the consequences of it, and why I refuse to free the three Chinese child workers in my basement despite the offers from the Federal Bureau of Investigations. See ya!